I want to talk to you today about mediocrity in the schools, of course, K-12, public specifically, but it's also happening in private. You've heard the expression, I'm sure, the soft bigotry of low expectations. Well, I was reminded of it today by a teacher I follow on Twitter, Mr. Daniel Buck. You should follow him too. He was talking about how he'd recently been told it was too much to expect his students to complete a 300-page book for English class. Not really a specific time given, just reading a 300-page book in and of itself across any period of time was too much. And that instead, he should cover excerpts from the book and supplement that with, are you ready, movie clips. So of course, that would mean using books that have been made into movies. That narrows the field of books you can use quite considerably, doesn't it? Not to mention it sort of forces you to show the kids an interpretation of the literature created by Hollywood. No conflict of interest there. Anyway, those of you who follow me and are subscribed to this channel may remember a video I did last summer explaining why I quit my summer teaching job and how it tied to the fact that the parents were annoyed I was asking their students to read a book, an actual book. I don't even think it was a 300 page book. I think it was under 300 pages, could be wrong, but it was a book rated for fourth graders and up. These were kids in seventh and eighth grade. I was told they were a couple of years behind, so I picked a book fourth grade level and I still got pushback, not because the book was too hard, but because it was a book at all. I couldn't think of a better way to teach them reading comprehension, vocabulary, writing, grammar, and spelling than to do a novel study that included the writing of summaries and summary sentences and some vocab quizzes from the book, etc. But the parents had other ideas, as did the program director. Now, the majority of those students were what we now hear described as historically marginalized, or so I was told. And yet, I was also told it was too much to expect them to read a book. They didn't want to. Their parents didn't want them to or expect them to, and therefore we should bend to that. And that that somehow would be helpful. I quit the job because I can't do things that conflict with my values. And even though I walked away from a paycheck that I had been counting on, I still feel like I did the right thing. I can't, I can't show so little respect for those children as to do what I was asked to do. And yet, countless thousands of teachers do it every day. Now, I don't want to sit in judgment of them or say, you know, what horrible people, I don't know what personal hurdles they're fa facing as far as you know, income and so forth. I don't know what they're dealing with. But I do know that that choice repeated thousands of times results in tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, possibly even millions of students who are being neglected. That's me being kind. I would actually say they're being abused. Their time's being wasted. They're being intellectually abused because they can do so much more and we're not asking it of them. That's not compassionate. That is encouraging mediocrity. Encouraging mediocrity. One of my commenters wrote the other day that there's a lesson she learned from dog trainers. What you pet, you get. Well, extrapolate from that to school. What you reward, you get. What you ask for, you get what you expect, you get. If you expect very little, you get very little. Very often you get less. If you expect a lot, it's unlikely you're gonna get everything you expect. So if you set the bar very low, you're, you're gonna get even lower than that. Why are we doing that? Why are we, and by we I mean as a people, as a nation, we taxpayers are paying for this. It may be compulsory, but we're still paying for it. We're still sending our kids every day. Why are we settling for that level of mediocrity? 
do we really believe that the mediocrity is separate from the politicization of the classroom? Daniel said, you know, as bad as the politicization is of the classroom, this push for mediocrity is is even worse because then the kids can't recognize the politics and fight back and so forth. I would argue they're one and the same. The push for mediocrity is political. I'm not saying on the part of each individual teacher who's going along with it. Probably not. Some, yes, for sure. But it probably is more to do with the mediocrity at every level of this field of education and the people at the very top in Washington and at your state board of ed and in the teachers unions and in the curriculum development companies who are achieving their goals, most of which are political or financial, going along with the push to mediocrity. It serves them well. Ignorant people don't ask questions because they don't realize what they don't know and they don't know what questions to ask. And they're much more willing to believe that people who have more letters after their names or who use bigger words or can read things they can't read must be smarter. Their expertise is deferred to more readily. So if your goal is to have a compliant population of people who don't ask too many questions or who ask only the questions you want them to ask, the ones you've prescripted for them in the media, and they're only asking them of their fellow citizens, why do you hate poor people? Why are you so racist? Why don't you listen to the experts? Why are you so anti-science? They're asking questions. They're just asking the questions that have been fed to them by their masters, the experts. They don't even realize that it's being done. They've been trained in these schools to do that. So the mediocrity is not separate from the politics. It's part of it. Read The Road to Serfdom. Look into, you know, how cults operate. Look into how any charismatic totalitarian leader has ever operated. The first thing they did was take over the schools. The second thing they did was dumb down the curriculum and make sure it was only focused around the things they wanted people to know. No more, no less. That's it. They're not separate. Now, if you want some specific examples of what I mean by mediocrity, I gave you one about the summer teaching where they didn't want to read a book. I hope that's a salient enough enough example, although it is anecdotal. And you might think, well, you were the teacher and maybe you're an intellectual snob and you picked a book that was too hard and it was just a summer program. And I mean, okay, let me give you another example from my tutoring. And I'm going to give you this example because it's been repeated dozens of times across the last, I would say, 10 years of my tutoring experience. This was not a novel occurrence. It just is the most recent one. Every single thing I'm going to tell you has repeated multiple times over with kids from different districts, different states, because I teach virtually. I tutor virtually for the most part. Um, it's been repeated. This is, not, this is not a novel occurrence. Just the most recent, just yesterday. I'm working with a girl in seventh grade. She is a bright student. She's not intellectually lacking in skill. She has been told, or her parents have been told she's ADHD, but I'm not really seeing that. I'm seeing a, a student who lacks study skills and lacks focus on material, but I also see material that doesn't require a lot of focus. I see assignments that don't ask much of her. And again, you get what you expect. So I'm not really sure that diagnosis is accurate at all. When she's asked to read a book, and she has been asked to read a book, it's not from beginning to end read the book. It's not even a chapter or two a day, everyone in the class read the same book, although they have been given a physical book, or her mom at least gave it to her. They read a chapter, they listen to a chapter in audiobook form. And when I asked her why they're still using the audiobook form, she said, this is a direct quote, there are too many kids in the class who don't read. This is seventh grade English. In a district that is supposed to be one of the best districts in the state where she lives, not my state, different state. So rather than refer those kids for medial reading or deal with those students and still do what you would expect seventh graders to do, which is ask them to read an entire book that is easily at their level, 
meaning at a seventh grade level, what you would expect seventh graders to be able to read. The teacher is accommodating that using audiobook. Now, I might be able to wrap my mind around that if the teacher were standing in the classroom and asking the students to follow along in the book word for word, even with their finger, so they could at least hear the correct pronunciation of vocabulary words they don't know. But she's not doing that. It's just puts on the book and the kids listen to or don't. So my student does as little as possible. She reads the chapter she's supposed to read and then she listens to the other chapters and I can tell the difference because then when she goes to answer the questions that are billed as reading comprehension questions, she can't answer them with anything other than phrases, incomplete sentences. And her answers really aren't correct. They're partially correct or not correct at all. And when she writes them down, they're in handwriting that I would expect from a second or third grader because they don't have to write very much. They do a lot of typing. So the handwriting is not at grade level, nor is it really legible, nor are the sentences complete. Seventh grade. So then I try to push for more complete answers. She can't give them. She's guessing. So, and, and these, are, these are what and where questions. I think there were five questions. Four of them are what questions. One was a where question. These are things you can skim for. All you really need to do is use your finger and go down in the text. And even some of the phrases begin with what really made him mad. And the question is what really made him mad? I mean, you, it's that exact. I still had to help her find where it was. That's how I know she didn't really read it. She just listened. And then I had to read the paragraph. Every other word she skipped or mispronounced. English is her first language. And even having just read it, she would just fire off answers that were not really thinking about it. It was like, what's the answer? What's the answer? Here's the answer. Here's the answer. And I understand why. Because she had turned in this homework before with answers she gave before I was her tutor and gotten them right. I wouldn't have marked them correct. I would have made comments. I would have pushed for her to read more closely. I would have taught her how to close read and underline words she doesn't know. So then let's let's talk about vocabulary a little bit. I tried to go over some of the vocabulary the prior week. I underlined the words. I asked her the words. She didn't know them. We looked them up together. She wasn't accustomed to looking up words. No one ever asked her to look up words she didn't know. There were lots of words that I would imagine she didn't know. Actually, she didn't, in fact, know them, I guess, correctly. She was tested on vocabulary. And I said, what words did, did you have in the test? So she read them to me. Mispronounced at least a third of them. And when I say mispronounced, I mean really mispronounced. The word receded came out recaded. Okay. So when I said, well, how did you know which words to study if you didn't underline them yourself and look them up? Oh, the teacher gave a list. The teacher gave a list of words with the definitions. So all you do is read and memorize it and then spit it back out on the test. But they're sitting in the tutoring session not even a couple days after having this vocabulary test, she could not correctly pronounce the word, spell it from memory, or tell me what it meant. Now, I asked the mom, how does the teacher say that she's doing? Because to my way of looking at it, she's at least a couple of grade levels behind, if not more, of what I would expect from a seventh grader. She showed me the progress report. The teachers were not even writing complete sentences as far as the progress report. Excellent work, doing fine, meets expectations. It, they had space, didn't fill it, didn't make any other comments. The grade for English language arts for this child is an A minus. In fact, most of her grades are in the A minus or B plus range. There is no way that comports with reality. Now, I'm not a big fan of grades, especially in middle school. I think it's a bit arbitrary. I'm much more concerned with what the kid can do and that they can do enough to move on to the next grade. This is a child in my personal estimation that was socially promoted probably from the third grade onward and has just been barely keeping up ever since. She can decode in terms of reading and she can understand about three fourths of what she's reading, but has absolutely no skills for improving herself and any improvement is going to be minimal at best. Not a lot of growth going on. 
And it's going to be harder and harder and harder to keep up if the work, I mean, unless the work keeps being dumbed down and they keep caving to mediocrity. When I say harder to keep up, I mean keep up with what a person of her age ought to be able to do. And if at any point in time she ends up in a place that expects her to perform at age or grade level, suddenly it's going to be like being thrown into a vat of ice water. So actually more accurately, it would be like sliding down a razor blade into a vat of alcohol. Pardon me for the excruciating visual, but that's what it would probably feel like. So this is just one example of many, many, many. And I've tried to explain to parents that they should know where their children really are. Do not take the teacher's word for it. The teacher says to you, your child is doing fine. I would say there's probably a better than 90% chance that's not true. Or their definition of fine and yours need some refinement. So when you look at those progress reports, you need to probe and you need to ask the teacher, what do you mean by fine? What do you mean by meeting expectations? Can I see your rubrics? Can I see your expectations? And if you're not getting answers to those questions, and you probably won't, do your own test. If you have a child above the fourth grade, grab any chapter book in the house that would be a children's chapter book, Harry Potter, for example, Charlotte's Web, Stuart Little, uh, a Magic Tree house book. I don't care. Pick some chapter book that's not all pictures. Have them read at least two or three paragraphs to you. And then have them sit down while you watch without the book in their hand, having just read it, and write a summary in their own words of what they just read. So if they read three paragraphs, have them write one short paragraph. Look for complete sentences, legible handwriting, correct spelling, correct grammar. And of course, that the sentences actually do summarize what they just read in a way that, you know, makes sense. Not just decent sentence, decent sentence, decent sense, like this happened, then this happened, then this happened. That, Unless they were literally in fourth grade, when that would be appropriate. But if you're dealing with a middle school kid, it should hang together. Should have more of a like, the main characters had to solve this problem. Here's how they did it. it. Didn't work so well. Whatever. Like it should have a beginning, middle, and an end to that paragraph and not just be sentences strung together. And if they have any difficulty with what I just described to you and they're getting any better than a C as a grade or their teacher is not lighting her hair, her, his hair on fire that you need some remediation or they need to have tutoring or something, um, your child is not fine. And then do the same with multiplication. They're older than fourth grade. Have them go through the times tables, as we used to call them, and just fill it all out from memory. Just fill it out on paper from memory. If they can recite them, so much the better. And if they can't do it, now, if they're fourth grader again, it's probably going to be slower, harder, maybe go to 10, fifth grade. They should know them. Yes, they should. Yes, they should. If you're older than fifth grade and they can't do this exercise, screech to a halt and start over because everything's going to get exponentially harder from here on out. And yet the teachers will tell you they're fine. They are satisfied with this level of mediocrity. Their grade inflation is off the charts. An A is not an A. You think you have an honor student? No, you don't. I would say most of you don't. Now, if your child is in an extremely rigorous private school, you already know, you've seen the syllabus, you've seen the rubrics, you've talked to the teachers, you get in-depth write-ups on how they're doing. Maybe they've even recommended a tutor and you're, you're all involved. Okay, I'm not talking to you. <laughs> I'm talking to the average public school parent or even private school parent who's getting these perfunctory, everything's great, don't even worry. It's fine, a oh, COVID. It's fine, it's just COVID. It's fine, they'll catch up. It's fine, everything's good. They're doing great. But you don't see any work. You really don't see any samples of your child's writing. You haven't heard your child read aloud since they were like six or seven and reading Dr. Seuss or something or ever. You need to know. You need to know because mediocrity is rampant and acceptable. And the argument is the academic skill is less important than how they feel. 
than their feelings of belonging in the class, than their worldview, than their empathy, that they're understanding that they belong to the group and the collective and their identities. That's what's taking precedence, you guys. And they're getting it spoon fed so they don't have to read it themselves. They are being told that ways of knowing that you and I would consider to be appropriate are white ways of knowing, are colonial ways of knowing, or colonizer ways of knowing, white supremacy ways of knowing. That's how they get out of actually doing it. That's how they're justifying mediocrity. But no matter how you put lipstick on that pig, it's still, it is still the pig from Animal Farm and your kids are still that horse that's going to be sent off to the glue factory if they don't comply. Again, sorry for the visuals, but I really need you to understand that the mediocrity is by design. Can't te- If they teach them skills, the kids could read things for themselves and start to ask too many questions. Can't have them asking questions that weren't put in their heads to ask. Can't have them reading challenging material that might contradict what they're being told. Can't have them doing math well enough to understand that the statistics flying at them at lightning speed are manipulated. You see where I'm going? There's no separation. Mediocrity is part of the politicization of the classroom. And the only thing standing between your child and artificial intellectual and emotional retardation is you. That's it. You're the, you're the thing. You're the person. Not the school board, not the board of ed, not the superintendent, not even the teacher. It's on you, mom and dad, or mom and mom, or dad and dad, or caregiver, or whomever I'm speaking to. It's on you. Stop taking their word for it. They're probably lying to you. Okay? What do you think they're going to do? Go, oh my God, everybody's failing. <laughs> Yet, Go look at the nation's report card. Just Google nation's report card and look for your state. While they're still allowing objective tests, you can see that they're lying. Why would kids be getting A's in English language arts? And yet they can't all be getting A's. And at the same time, 70% of them can't read. How does that work exactly? Unless the A doesn't mean anything. See where I'm going with this? So... They say it's soft bigotry of low expectations. I would call it hardcore, hardcore bigotry of low expectations. But it's not just aimed at the historically marginalized kids. It's probably most egregious when it's aimed at any child whose family does not have the resources and that often sucks up the historically marginalized, but not always. Plenty of white kids' parents at this point with inflation and gas through the roof and groceries through the roof don't have the resources for private tutors, don't have the resources to even get proper diagnostics done or to relocate to a better district. So it's it's affecting everyone. It's affecting everyone. But it, I feel like it's most egregious when you have people patting themselves on the back for being so virtuous and caring so much about the black and brown children and their and equitable outcomes and then doing the exact opposite of helping these kids achieve greatness. So what equity really means is making sure all the kids are doing equally poorly. So all the kids will be good and angry and malleable and good little servants of the state. That's what it's about. That's what equity is about. So consider yourself notified. Your child's progress report is probably a lie. Go find out for yourself. Thanks for watching. As always, if you value this content, I hope you consider subscribing to the channel. I also hope you will consider joining my locals at thereasonwelearn.locals.com where you will get subscriber-only content like two lives a week about homeschooling and about education in America that do not make it onto YouTube, as well as a weekly Zoom call to talk to me directly, and you get discounts on private tutoring and many other perks. Um, You can also contribute to the channel using many of the methods. I have a Patreon account, I have PayPal. It really does help me keep doing this Thanks for watching. Please like, share, and comment. I'll see you next time.